This lecture has the goal of introducing some of the interesting Old Testament artifacts that archaeology has discovered. For example, you have the Sumerian king list, which relates to ancient Near Eastern accounts of the flood. The Sumerian king list was written around 2100 BC. It's written in Sumerian, which is the oldest known written language. The text itself is an account of kings who lived before and after a great flood. And judging from the numbers that are in the account, the flood might relate to around 2900 BC. And the description of it is such that it leads some to wonder if this isn't related to Noah's flood. Also interesting is the fact that the people that are listed there, especially before the flood, live extraordinarily long lifespans. Some of the earliest kings are said to have lived for tens of thousands of years. And yet, before we completely dismiss these kings as fictional characters, you have one king, Enme Baragisi of Kish. He's said to have lived for 900 years, and that seems fabulous. And yet that same Enme Baragisi of Kish left a historical inscription that archaeologists have discovered. So regardless of what you think of the number, he seems to have been a real person. Also related to ancient Near Eastern accounts of the flood is the Atrahasis epic. It dates to the 1700s BC, written in the Akkadian language. It tells the story of how the god Enki saved the hero Atrahasis from the flood sent by God, by the god Enlil, to destroy man because man was just too noisy. Enlil couldn't sleep in his temple at night because mankind was partying too much and was too noisy. And so he decided to wipe mankind out. Enlil is the storm wind. Enki told Atrahasis to build a boat and save his life. And it sounds a lot like Noah and the flood. Unfortunately, the text breaks off there. It's only fragmentary. But the same story seems to be picked up in another ancient Near Eastern account of the flood, uh, the Gilgamesh epic. We have a copy of the text in the 600s BC. The original story was written earlier. It refers to Gilgamesh's search for immortality. He wanted to live forever, and he was trying to figure out how to do that. He met a man, Utnapishtim, whom the gods gave immortality after he survived the flood. And it tells a story that is reminiscent of the story of Noah and the ark. At one point, Utnapishtim is actually called Atrahasis, which shows that this is a continuation or a, another version of that earlier story. So anyway, the story of Noah and uh, the Ark is often compared with the Atrahasis epic and the Gilgamesh epic. And they are probably pagan garbled versions of the same story that we have in the Bible. In the Bible, you have the story of the Tower of Babel. And there's some question, is the Tower of Babel something like this, a tower that tried to reach into heaven? Or is the Tower of Babel something like this? This is a ziggurat. There's been a couple of dozen of these that were found in the ancient Near East, the ruins of them. There was one in Babel, which is Babylon. It may be that the Tower of Babel is more this uh, Mesopotamian temple tower rather than something that was literally trying to reach uh, into the heavens. Now we have a text of Semitic tribesmen put on a wall inscription in uh, 1873 BC in Beni Hassan, Egypt. And this shows us what the patriarchs probably look like. These Semitic tribesmen came from Syro-Palestine, and it shows the style of dress and uh, the animals that they had using donkeys and the like. 
And if you want to know what the patriarchs look like, this artwork gives you a pretty good idea. As compared with the Egyptian guy in the top right, who uh, has a d different style of attire. Now, sometimes it talks about how Abraham and others set up stellas or sacred pillars. And we've actually discovered some of those types of things. Here we have a stella with hands raised to the moon god at Hatzor, which is in Israel. It reminds us of uh, Genesis uh, 35 and verse 14, a pillar of stone that was raised as testimony of God's revelation to Jacob. This was similar to customs that Canaanites practice as well. Then we have this guy here. Uh, this is actually the mummy of Ramses II. He relates to Exodus 1.11. One of the store cities that was built in Egypt was the store city of Ramses. And it probably refers to P. Ramses, the city that Ramses II, whose mummy is portrayed here, built uh, for himself. He rebuilt the city of Avaris and renamed it after himself. Well, if the 13th century of the date of the Exodus is correct, and that's one of the two theories, then this would be the pharaoh of the Exodus. We actually have the remains of his body. Uh, this is what he looked like in better days, a statue of Ramses II, who had a very long reign and has uh, lots of artwork portraying him. On the other hand, 1 Kings 6 1 says that the Exodus took place 480 years before Solomon's fourth year, which would date the Exodus to around 1446 BC. The city of Ramses may be an updating of the old name. Perhaps the city that is called in the Bible Ramses was originally that Hyksos capital Avaris and would have been called that at the time that the Israelites were building there. If the city of Ramses is just an updating of a name that had become obsolete, Avarice, for later audiences, this would make Thutmose III, who reigned approximately 1479 through 1425, the probable pharaoh of the Exodus. And here we have an image of Thutmose III. The Israelites in Egypt were forced to make bricks as part of their slave labor. And we have Semitic and Nubian POWs making bricks in a 15th century tomb in Thebes that show you the sort of things that uh, the Israelites would have done in gathering material, taskmaster watching over him, moving the bricks. Again, a couple of taskmasters, one with whip and one with a rod. Anyway, that's the brick-making process portrayed in a tomb inscription in Thebes. So if you want to know what the Israelites were doing, we'll look to this drawing. Another important inscription from Egypt is the Merneth Ptah inscription. Merneth Ptah was the successor of Ramses. And his famous Merneth Ptah Israel stella dates to 1207 BC, in which he refers to Israel as living in Palestine at the time. And obviously they have left Egypt by then. The inscription has that at the bottom, uh, where it mentions all the different people that Merneth Ptah whipped up on, people and places. He says in the bottom of the inscription, Israel is desolate, his seed is no more. And this is the first mention of Israel outside of the Bible. And it uses a sign that indicates this is a people group. And so Israel as a people group was in Palestine by 1207 BC. So if the Exodus occurred anywhere like the way the Bible portrays it, they have to be in the land by 1207. When we get to the biblical laws, they're often compared with the laws of Hammurabi, which were written down around 1760 BC. 
They differ in ideology between biblical law in a variety of ways. The laws of Hammurabi make it a theft a capital offense if you stole from a higher class sort of person, whereas the Bible does not generally make crimes of property capital offenses. It values human life differently than Hammurabi did. At the top of the stella that has all the laws that are listed underneath this image, you have an image of Hammurabi standing before the god Shamash. You can tell he's a god by the hat that he wears. Uh, Shamash was the god of justice. He's giving Hammurabi a rod and a ring, which is symbolic of his authority to rule. And that's similar to the way that the god Yahweh gave the law to Moses. Now, the Bible talks about building altars, and we've actually found an altar in Beersheba, at Tel Beersheba in the Iron Age period that would place it around the 700s B.C., it was an illegal altar because it was cut with tools to make everything square. Whereas, according to the law in the Book of the Covenant in Exodus chapter 20, they were to make altars with unhewn stones. You can see the horns of the altar. The horns of the altar stick up, would allow the coals to be here, and would help keep things from falling out. And you could put some sort of griddle on top of it and uh, do your burning of the uh, offerings on top of that. You also have uh, indications of Canaanite religion and their gods. Here's an image of the god El. El was the head of the Canaanite pantheon. He was the father of the other gods. The word El is also used as a common Semitic word for God. And some who worship El in Genesis may have worshipped this god, they also worship the god Bel. Bel is a title for the Semitic storm god Hadad. Bel actually means Lord. Bel was a nature deity who was supposed to give fertility to the land and became the most prominent of the Canaanite gods. And then you have the goddess Ashtoreth, the mother goddess of fertility. She was the consort of Bel in the mythology. And here you have a portrayal of her. We also have information about the Philistines. The Philistines, as it turned out, tried to invade Egypt in the time of Ramses III, around 1200 BC. They failed in that attempt and were captured. And here they're being hauled away with ropes around their necks. Uh, as captives of war. And you can see the distinctive style of their war outfit with the kind of a brushy uh, headdress. But anyway, they are portrayed in Egyptian art and identified as Philistines. Archaeologists have found gates at three different sites, at Megiddo and Hatsor and Gezer, and according to the Bible, Solomon rebuilt those cities. And all of them have similar design gates. You can see it on the shot here where as you would try to go in, there would be places where during times of peace, you might have sellers uh, selling stuff. But during times of war, you'd have warriors. So if you broke through, they'd attack you on both sides. And if you get a little farther, there'd be more people attacking you on both sides. And a third one uh, yet here. And anyway, you have a similar gate at Megiddo. You have a similar gate at Hatsor and a similar gate at Gezer. These all may well be and probably are the gates that uh, were built by Solomon when he renovated the sites at Megiddo, Hatsor, and Gezer. Not everything in archaeology can be proven. On the right, there's a small pomegranate decoration, and it was once thought to be dedicated to Solomon's temple. And if that's so, it was only it's the only known artifacts from Solomon's temple, though the authenticity of the inscription belonging to the temple of the Lord, holy to the priests, is now questioned. Others now think that it was a Bronze Age artifact 
that someone came along in order to make money on the antiquities market and added the inscription to associate it with Solomon's temple, which would make it much more valuable. Unfortunately, we can't prove this is authentic, though it probably is an authentic uh, Bronze Age artifact. Uh, the question is whether the inscription was forged later. A man that invaded Egypt was Shishak. According to the Bible, came into uh, Palestine and whooped up on both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah after the division of the monarchy. And Shishak left inscriptions. He left an inscription at the Karnak temple, temple of Amun in Thebes in Egypt. And it's a fragmentary wall text listing 166 cities in Palestine that Shishak invaded around the year 925 BC, an event that's also mentioned in the Bible. Here you have a portrayal of Shishak. The Egyptian pronunciation is Shoshinak. In the Hebrew Bible, it shows up as Shishak. Shishak also left a victory stella at Megiddo, celebrating his victory there, and that has been discovered by archaeologists. And he probably put a fortress at uh, Gerar in southern Judah as well. And so here is a case of something we have in the Bible and something also being mentioned by an extra-biblical source. At Tel Dan, there is this inscription written in archaic Aramaic script. This inscription in Aramaic found at Tel Dan may have been left by Ben Hadad at the, the time that Ben Hadad invaded from the north at the time of Asa, king of Judah. The text has a line that refers to the house of David. This is the earliest extra biblical reference to David dates to the 800s BC, that's the 9th century, mid 9th century BC. And that would have been about a century after the time of David. Here's another famous artifact that has been discovered, the Moabite stone, or the also called the Mesha inscription. It was a victory stella by King Mesha of Moab, celebrating how he won independence from Israel. He refers specifically to how Omri had subjugated Moab, but he was able to rebel and gain independence. And the story of his gaining independence is also found in the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 3. The Bible doesn't say that it was Omri that conquered Moab, but from this Mesha inscription, we now know that he was the one that had forced Moab to be subservient to Israel. Mesha gained his independence from Israel after Jehoram and Jehoshaphat, in a coalition, tried to reconquer it and failed to do so, as described in 2 Kings 3. We also, from archaeology, know something about the importance of the city of Samaria. And you can see the ruins of Samaria here. Samaria was founded by the king Omri, that also conquered Moab. And at its lowest levels, they found 500 ivory fragments, used mostly as inlays for wooden panels and furniture boxes and toiletry items. And the fact that they had ivory, that was a luxury import item, shows the economic clout of Omri. He was a pretty important king politically and economically. He conquered Moab, and he had a great deal of wealth for himself. Another important artifact is the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. And on the far left, you can see... What it looks like is a rather tall thing. And then you can see some details on it. Uh, the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser shows in one little section how Yehu, the son of Omri, 
was bowing down to King Shalmaneser. So here you have King Shalmaneser. Here you have Yehu, or his emissary, maybe more likely his emissary, paying homage to Shalmaneser and submitting to his authority as a, as a vassal. Uh, Yehu, in the year 841 BC, seized the throne of Israel, but was forced to submit to Shalmaneser III of Assyria. Yehu, on the inscription, is called the son of Omri. He was not literally the son of Omri. He was a usurper of the throne of Omri. Son may mean here successor, in which case it would be correct, or it may be a mistake on the part of the Assyrian scribe that just assumed that he must be a son or descendant of the more famous king, Omri, who they uh, knew quite well in Assyria. Here's another interesting inscription. Uh, this uh, dates to the Hellenistic period, that's the Greek period, but it's written in Aramaic and it says this, Hither were brought the bones of Uzziah, the king of Judah, do not open. Uzziah, also called uh, Azariah, is uh, described in the Bible. He was struck with leprosy when he tried to usurp the role of priests and conduct priestly duties. Apparently, his bones were moved and put in a new place, and an inscription was put on not to disturb those bones though uh, apparently that was ignored. Here's another artifact, a seal of Shema, who is said to be the servant of Jeroboam. And that's probably a reference to Jeroboam II, who reigned in the Northern Kingdom from 793 to 753 BC. One of the famous kings of Assyria is Tiglath-Pileser, who had campaigns that affected Israel and Judah from 744 to 729 BC. That's the years that he reigned. He forced the northern kingdom of Israel to submit to him and forced Judah also to become a vassal under Ahaz at the time of Isaiah. Sargon II of Assyria is important. He reigned from 721 to 705 BC, and he plays an important role in Samaria. Samaria, according to the Bible, was conquered by Shalmaneser V, but Shalmaneser died around that time in 722 BC and was succeeded by Sargon II, who, according to his own inscription, proceeded to start deporting the population. So from around 721 to around 718, large numbers of Samaritans were deported to Assyria. And that's the beginning of the 10 lost tribes where most of the northern population of the 10 northern tribes were deported by Sargon to Assyria where they assimilated and ceased to be identifiable as Israelites. Another king of Assyria was Sennacherib, who invaded Judah in 701 BC. And from his own inscriptions, we can see the cities that he conquered. They're listed on the map here. He conquered Laish. He also besieged Jerusalem, though he did not succeed in uh, conquering it, though Hezekiah of Jerusalem agreed to pay tribute in order to break the besiegement. Sennacherib's own account of this is in the Taylor Prism, which is now found in the British Museum. It gives Sennacherib's version of the events of 701 BC, events that are given in the Bible, and events that Sennacherib gives from his own perspective. And an interesting line here is he had Hezekiah in Jerusalem. He describes him as a cage bird in his royal city, Jerusalem. Here's a scene from Sennacherib's palace showing the besiegement, not of Jerusalem, but of another Judean city, Laish, uh, where you have the Assyrian soldiers surrounding, you have the 
Judeans on the hilltop shooting their arrows down at them. Here you have women being captured and taken off as prisoners. Here you have uh, Israel, uh, Judean men being impaled. Uh, that's the sort of thing that you saw as you walked into his palace, uh, scenes of war like this. And this is his subtle little way of this is what happens to people that rebel against the Assyrian king. There's that detail of the women taken and captive and uh, the men being impelled from that inscription on the wall palace. Hezekiah, the king of 701 BC, also is known for having built a tunnel to let water into the walled city even when it was being besieged. That's uh, described in 2 Kings chapter 20 in the parallel in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. And we actually found archaeological evidence of this. We have, uh, this is what Hezekiah's tunnel looks like in the rainy season where it might be as deep as your belt. But the Siloam inscription was found in the middle of this tunnel. And what the inscription says is as follows. It's written in archaic Hebrew. Behold the excavation. Now this is the story of the excavation. While the excavators were lifting up the pick, each towards his neighbor, and while there were yet three cubits to excavate, then was heard the voice of one man calling to his neighbor, for there was an excess of rock on the right hand and on the left. And after that, on the day of excavating, the excavators had struck pick upon pick, one against the other, and water flowed from the spring to the pool for a distance of 1,200 cubits. And 100 cubits was the height of the rock over the heads of the excavators. So in the middle of that tunnel, they put uh, this inscription celebrating the time when digging from two different directions, they met in the middle and allowed water to flow into Jerusalem. Again, this is something recorded in the Bible and also in this archaeologically found inscription in the Siloam Tunnel. Now, Babylon kept historical accounts of a lot of their doings, and the Babylonian Chronicles are important uh, accounts of the life of Nebuchadnezzar and late Babylonian history. That includes a record of doings in 605 to 594 BC, where Nebuchadnezzar had uh, campaigns in Syro-Palestine and captured Jerusalem on the 15th, 16th of March of 597 BC. Found in Babylon, a Babylonian ration list that happens to mention the exiled king. After Jerusalem was captured in 597, they exiled Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, and discovered in Babylonian digs, was this ration list is an extra biblical document saying what things were given to different people. In particular, it mentions Jehoiachin as receiving rations and is a direct confirmation that Jehoiachin was in fact exiled to Babylon just as the Bible says. Now here we have an important seal, but unfortunately disputed. During the 1970s, two identical bulle, which are clay seal stamps, they're the impression that the seal made. There's like 17 by 16 millimeters, and they showed up in the antiquities market. The inscription reads, belonging to Berachiahu, the son of Neriahu, the scribe. And that's a reference to Jeremiah's scribe, which in the Bible, in the English translation, is translated Baruch. Now, because it was discovered in the antiquities market, we don't know whether this is a genuine thing that someone just found in their backyard or whether it might be a forgery, which is very unfortunate because if it's authentic, it would have been nice to know the provenience of it that would demonstrate its authenticity. 
We know of the greatness of Babylon from the Ishtar Gate. The Ishtar Gate was discovered, and here you have an image of a lion, which is also kind of the symbol of Babylon itself. The Ishtar Gate would have looked something like what's on the right. You have an artist's reconstruction of its look. Here are some of the ruins found at Babylon. And despite the fact that it's all in ruins, you can still see some of the greatness of Babylon, even in the artwork that has survived for 3,000 years. When we go down to the Persian period, we have this document, the Cyrus Cylinder. It's only nine inches long. This says a number of things, that Cyrus was welcomed by Babylon as a liberator from its king, Nabonidus. Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon. He was also helped by his son, Belshazzar, who was acting king when Nabonidus was away. Nabonidus is not mentioned by the Bible, but his son Belshazzar is. Cyrus says that the god of Babylon, Marduk, had given him the victory over Babylon. And that he allowed various captive peoples to go home and rebuild their sanctuaries. And he returned to them their national treasures. Now this is all very similar to what the Bible says that Cyrus did for the Jews. The Jews uh, were allowed to return from Babylon by Cyrus. You'll read about that in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Cyrus says that it was Yahweh, the God of Israel, that gave him victory and told him to let the Jews go back to their homeland. And he also gave them the right to rebuild their temple and return to them some of the national treasures that, that the Babylonians had stolen. This suggests that Cyrus would speak in the name of whatever local deity there was. So when he's talking to Babylon, he spoke in the name of Marduk. Marduk gave him the victory. But when he spoke to the Jews, oh, it was Yahweh that told him to do what he did. We have the tomb of Cyrus found in Iran. Other Persian leaders include Darius. This is what Darius looks like in the left. We have a gold riton of the uh, Alchemedid period that would have been an artifact that was in use during the time of the Persian occupation of Palestine. From wall art, we know what the soldiers of the Alchemedid period would have looked like, and this is an artist's uh, reconstruction of what that would have been like on the right. Xerxes is an important fellow, and here he is portrayed on the left. Xerxes' other name, the name that the Bible gives him is Ahasuerus. He was the husband of Esther. His Persian name is almost unpronounceable. Uh, you can uh, look at those letters and you try to pronounce it. But it's something like uh, Kasharyar Shan. Xerxes is a garbling of that Persian name into Greek where it's pronounced Xerxes. And it's garbled into Hebrew as a Chaschas. Anyway, it's uh, the same person, uh, even though they look very different in English transliteration. Now, a famous thing that allowed us to know about Persian and also Akkadian, came from an inscription that was on a mountainside that was deciphered by this man on the right, Henry Rollison, a British person during the time of Britain's occupation of Iran. And apparently he was kind of bored, and so he got interested in ancient inscriptions. And he found an inscription on the mountainside. You can see it on the left, which shows certain captives of war and Ahura Mazda, the god of Persia, uh, on the top. And then you have Darius, uh, the king, uh, who is receiving the captives. The inscriptions give a first-hand account of Darius's reign. And it happens to be a trilingual inscription in Akkadian, 
in another language of that area, Elamite, and in Old Persian. Rawlinson, first of all, was able to decipher the Old Persian, able to do so because he had a knowledge of Farsi, which is the Iranian language today. Farsi and Persian are more modern and more ancient versions of the same language. And from that, he and a rival investigator, a fellow named uh, Edward uh, Hinks, was able to decipher the parallel Akkadian text. Since he assumed it was a trilingual inscription, having figured out what the Persian said, he was able to work out the system of writing that was Akkadian. Great accomplishment in uh, biblical archaeology, because now Akkadian texts can be translated, whereas until 1850, that was completely impossible. Here you can see the trilingual inscription. The Akkadian version was on the left. You had two different Elamite versions, but then on the bottom you had the old Persian version. Now this inscription was not really meant to be read by ordinary people. It was put on the side of a mountain. Rawlinson actually had to use ropes and make uh, presses using uh, wet paper, uh, wet paper mesh in order to find out what the inscriptions look like in order to start deciphering them. Well, that concludes my discussion of some of the important artifacts that are relevant to the Old Testament found through biblical archaeology. And my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle.